Hello and welcome to a brand new Arse Blog Arsecast right here on arseblog.com. How are you? Hope you're well. If you're an Arsenal fan, I'm pretty sure you are after what we witnessed last night, a 2-1 win over Wolves at the Emirates, coming from behind, a late Nicolas Pepe equaliser and a super, super late, 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 late winner from Alexandra Lacazette. I know officially it's not his goal. I know it's gone down as an own goal, but for various reasons that I don't have to explain to anybody, thank you very much, I'm choosing to believe it was a Lacazette goal because I think from that perspective, it's a lot more positive for Arsenal and a lot more positive for him. Uh, We're going to get straight on with this particular conversation. With me to talk about it all, one of the co-hosts of the excellent Stadio podcast, it's Ryan Hunt. Hello, Ryan. Hi, Andrew. How are you? I'm all right, thanks. Do I get to say the? Do I get to say goodly morning? <laughs> if you want, I think you can. Mama made it. Goodly morning to you, Andrew. <laughs> and goodly morning to you. James is not here uh, because, of course, he is doing his stage show, so he wasn't um, able to see the match last night, even if somebody did come up on stage and tell him that Arsenal had won <laughs> right in the middle of his show. Maybe we'll try and touch in, uh, touch base with James a, a little bit later on. But I'm trying to figure out where to start with this one because it's it's such a an interesting game to look at in its entire context because of the position of the two teams in the table, what a win for them would have meant, what the game state was, the scenario that we got ourselves into, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't ideal. It's fair to say. Um, And there's part of me that just wants to fucking talk about the last couple of minutes for the Mm. next hour. So, Maybe we'll start with some of the stuff that, you know, led us to that moment, that eruption of enjoyment towards the end when, uh, you know, when it looked for a time that it was going to be a bit of a frustrating night for us. And, uh, you know, for the conversation that we might have had to have on the podcast this morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, where to begin? To be honest, I, my main takeaway was that as frustrating as it was, I didn't think Arsenal played that bad. Sure. Honest, and this isn't um, this isn't a a Swansea twenty ten on a Monday night where we lose two one and they only mm. have one shot on target kind of vibe. This is a this is a good side. You've looked. I mean, all the stats that were coming out about it about how they haven't lost a game where they've led since two thousand eighteen. If you just run back through, we we talk about Wolves quite a lot in Stadio, just how impressive they're and close their games are, and they have been all season. Mm. I mean, even the Man City game away. You know, it, Man City scraped through that, and that was only after Raúl Jiménez got sent off. So, this is a good football team, yeah, a very efficient football team, and I think also for the the, the kind of team that Arsenal tend to struggle to match up against, they kind of remind me of those super efficient Spurs teams where we went through a phase that we just couldn't deal with them. You know, this um, a, a real collective, almost like a hive, they were kind of like, like a hive mind. You know, I suppose I should use the term pack considering they're called wolves <laughs> but but teams that we tend to struggle against and who don't need many opportunities to hurt you and i think we saw that you know their their, their chance was obviously an arsenal error they jumped on it straight away and then they had that second one was it quite early in the second half the one that went through ramsdale's legs and he kind of caught up and that yeah. was just it just came out of nowhere and I think that was that was quite interesting seeing the contrast in the performances. I thought Arsenal had more of the ball. They created more chances, but the chances that Wolves did create seemed to be way more dangerous yeah. instantly. That was my sense of it, to be honest, because I, you know, I, I agree with you in that we did play quite well and we controlled the game and yeah. we obviously had lots of attempts. I think by the 75th minute, we had had 22 attempts on goal to Wolves Mm. five, three on target each, something like that. But to me, it did feel like the danger that Wolves posed was a little more, more um, potent than ours, right? Because there was the goal, the early goal. And then there was a very, very good chance for Raul Jimenez um, when he got between the two central defenders and dragged a shot wide. And I was fearing the worst there. And there was another moment where I think some of our, sloppiness or whatever you want to call it in the first half we weren't we just weren't quite there we weren't quite on it as we were in other games and there was a moment when Gabriel could have just cleared the ball from inside our box and instead he tried to clip it over the defender and play it up the line which in one way is admirable but 
when you're a bit shaky at the back anyway, sometimes you just need to put your foot through it. You know, you don't have to uh, always play out from the back. And from there, they got, I think this could have been late in the first half, but they got a, a cross from their right-hand side. Jimenez with another header, it went not far wide. And hmm. those moments were kind of worrying to me because one of the one of the things that I think we've been impressed by is is how compact we've been, how well organized we've been as a defensive unit, how we're not really giving up those good chances that were kind of a hallmark of this team for the last few years where we could have control, we could play well, but the opposition were able to cut through us at will and they could have these fantastic chances. So that to me was a a little bit worrying in terms of... um, the way we were playing in this first half and when you think about Wolves and how good they are defensively, how how few goals they concede in the Premier League. I think I was saying to Lewis, myself and Lewis were talking on the preview podcast on Patreon. The last thing you want to do in this game is go a goal down against Wolves and have them play to their strengths because they are organized. They are yep. um, well drilled. They are also hugely cynical which is, I'm not being critical about that, but they are a team that knows how to play the game and play the game, if you know what I mean. So, yep. you know, to combat that as well as trying to get goals against a team that don't concede a lot of goals, I think it was always going to be, it was always going to be quite difficult. So in terms of how this game went in the early stages, I don't think it could have been much worse. Um, no. I mean, it could have been worse, obviously, if Wolves had scored those goals. But but the, the scenario you wanted to avoid is exactly the scenario that we foisted upon ourselves with a very, very sloppy uh, concession of a goal. Yeah, I mean, the only sides who have conceded fewer goals in the Premier League this season are the top three. And one of those is Liverpool, who mm. have conceded the same amount. So this is a an extremely, I'd, I'd say, elite defensive unit in the Premier League in a league that is deep in terms of how strong it is now. Moose and I talk about this on Stadio all the time about how deep the Premier League is now and this kind of solidifying of the Premier League middle class, which is just way stronger than it was even yeah. five years ago, to yeah, be honest, let alone 10. I agree. So I think it's quite hard. Uh, I think as, as fans, sometimes we judge these fixtures through the prism of history and it's kind of just not like that anymore. These sides are just so good. Even you saw how good Brentford were in the early stages of the season they're obviously falling off a bit now but I mean I I just thought after the game well to be honest from a personal point of view because this week has just been grim on multiple levels outside of football let alone in football mm. I didn't realise how much I really needed that yeah, yeah, you know yeah I mean yeah. afterwards yeah. It's, it's been a while since and I know that late late wins are great and it's really easy to get caught up in the euphoria of, to it but uh, with it sorry but I was saying to a friend of mine after the game just uh shit I didn't actually realize how much I really needed that yeah and um to the point where I, I actually uh, screenshotted it and posted it on Twitter saying that I was going to be on Arsblog tomorrow <laughs> he said uh, you know I'm a bit I was a bit gutted it was an own goal and I just said I couldn't give a fuck <laughs> I could not care any less because this feels like I mean this feels like one of those wins that could have very easily been the game that we could have pointed to in the summer as where it all changed and that's where the race for the top four kind of fell away mm. you know it's 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 easy to to over over egg stuff like this but i do think that having had a bit of you know having slept on it and gone back and rewatched it and seen read some of the stuff about it it really feels like the conditions that led to it a good side an early penalty shout that oh would have been the thing that we would have gone back to had had we not won the game uh wolves could have had a couple more to be honest or at least one more and then arsenal really turning the screw and getting a late win against a a direct rival one of these games in hand that arsenal need to be extremely careful not to waste those opportunities it just really felt like a win that was it felt like more than a win Yes, you know, and, and and I think that's why that it was it felt so important during the game. And I think the fan, I think you could tell with the atmosphere in the stadium that everyone knew how big this fixture was. Yeah, no, I agree with you as well. You know, from a, a personal point of view, I was at a, a funeral all day yesterday. On top of everything else that was going on in the world, my my aunt passed away this week, and you're so. you're sort of yeah. But it's it's one of those where you look to football as the kind of escape. 
yeah. um, that it can be and should be. Um, and I know, look, it's a serious business. We all love it and it is serious and we spend our lives talking and analyzing it and, you know, obsessing over it. But you get to the end of the game, you get to the 90th minute plus six minutes of injury time and that goes in the back of the net. And just for those however many seconds, there is nothing else just nothing else and there is nothing like it that that feeling that experience and knowing that you know I'm sitting watching my TV or my computer screen and you're sitting watching your TV and those 60,000 people are in the stadium and there's millions of people around the world and we are all just sharing this moment in exactly exactly the same way it's there's something so pure about it and I think we all need that at times but let's just go back to that moment at the start of the game um, the penalty shout that wasn't given I don't want to dwell too much on referees or officiating because so much has been said about it over the last couple of weeks but I I've, I find it exhausting to have to contend with not just the opposition and good opposition and well-drilled opposition and improving opposition, as you say, you know, the quality of, of teams in the Premier League, but it feels like week on week on week, we are having to contend with outside forces that we've got no control over as well. And on the one hand, it is hugely frustrating. It really is to see decisions like that not go our way. And I'm thinking of the the Tommy Asu stamp in the Everton game and, and MacArthur on Saka in the Crystal Palace game. Decisions which could ha- could have had a really, really big impact on those um, those games and the results because they should have been down to 10 men um, before halftime on both of those. But at the same time, I'm trying to look at it in a... In a Sanguine maybe is not Mm. quite the right word, but if I'm looking for positives from anything and trying to find positives in things, it's, it's that moments like that, I think, genuinely are contributing to the us against them mentality that is starting to become, um, quite entrenched among Arsenal fans. I said this to somebody this morning that like the us against them thing is so good because for ages as Arsenal fans, there's been too much us against us. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? And I Mm. love the fact that there is this spirit inside the stadium. And I love the fact that, you know, the Wolves celebrations celebrate in the right way. And, you know, these things which are kind of inconsequential, really, when it comes to the nuts and bolts of it, but they're bringing fans together and they're helping fans get behind what seems to be real progress from this team, something that is developing that we can all absolutely hang our hats on. Like, you know, nobody's taking anything for granted, I don't think. But you look at the players, you look at the manager, you look at the connections, the communication, the the sense of something that is happening is really shared now among fans. Yeah, I think the last time I was on, we were talking about how this this iteration of Arsenal kind of reminds me a little bit of when NBA teams pick up a load of really interesting young draft picks mm. and you know they're going to kind of be a, a bit ropey for a few years, but you see the direction of travel. And I think that it's it's something that you can look at a few other clubs who are going through it at the moment. Um, you know, one on the other the other side of North London. <laughs> and I think that one of the main issues is that there isn't really like an identifiable direction of travel. Yeah. <clears throat> because when there is, people really invest. And I think that what Arteta has done, I remember chatting to Ken early on second captains, I think it was just before Christmas. And that we were talking about how, you know, Arteta has almost had these phases of management. It was the initial kind of just stop, for want of a better term, stop the bleeding. Mm-hmm. And then the recovery period and then the really like, okay, now it's my time to to build. It's almost like watching Grand Designs, you know, you've got, you got to live in the caravan next to the spot for a little while and it sucks. <laughs> but then eventually afterwards, Kevin McLeod comes back and he's just like, wow, look at this. I really like what you've done here. How much over budget in- are you? Oh, only about exactly. 170 million. <laughs> st- uh, why did you, why did you decide to do this when you're pregnant with twins? Why does everyone do that on Grand Designs? I have no idea. But um, uh, I think we're in this stage of our, with, with Arteta's management now where I think this is what he tried to create. And I think 
he deserves a lot of credit for kind of keeping his mouth shut when he could have really gone after a lot of people during the process to get here. Now, I'm not saying that all of a sudden we're, we're done, we're sorted, we're good to go. But that direction of travel has been so easily identifiable, especially this season, I think. I think this is why I was quite zen after the Brentford game, because I just thought, like, if we're still in this position in October, then we need to worry in terms of what the squad looks like and in terms of what the results are like. But everything has just been a slow building process. And I think that while there are still going to be, there are going to be some results that are crap because this is still a, a team figuring it out. However, I think as we're heading into March, if you'd asked any Arsenal fan after that Brentford game that, that this is where Arsenal would be heading into March, I don't think anyone would have believed you. And I think it's really important to, to take those wins because mm-hmm. that's essentially what football is about, right? You don't have to... It's not like... It's why all this celebration police stuff just really pisses me off for everyone, not just Arsenal, any... Like, when yeah. Spurs beat Man City, it's just like, let them enjoy it, man. That's an amazing win. You know, like, that is a big, big win. Let teams and fans support their wins, no matter how big or small they are. It doesn't have to be like, Champions League is the only barometer of success, mm. and if you don't get there, then it's failure. <clears throat> and I think Arsenal have really been through it over the last few years... It's been, you know, Arteta as a manager has probably had to deal with, if you actually wrote a list of all of the stuff that he's had to deal with in his first senior management job, Mm. it's kind of wild. And take those wins, take those victories. I think Arsenal probably a little bit ahead of schedule. And it might tail off a little bit before it gets better again. But this is, I think it's... Despite there being obvious flaws, it's still hugely positive. Sure. I, I don't disagree with that. Apart from the bit about Spurs, um, you know, I don't want Sorry, them to enjoy sorry. anything. You know, let's well, let's be realistic here. No, I believe it. You know, it's just football karma, Andrew. It's just like, you know, if, no. if you can turn around and say, hey, guys, I didn't take the piss out of you. So don't take the piss no, out of no, you. No, no, no. It doesn't work for me at all. You know, I, I, I understand <clears> the magna, uh, being magnanimous and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, there's well, a the line. Difference is, the difference is, is this is an Arsenal podcast. Exactly. And on Stadio, we yeah, are yeah. a neutral podcast. Well, that's exactly it. So, you you know, yeah, you got to put your Arsenal hat on a bit. Got to be diplomatic. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's talk about what the scenario was at halftime then. Yes. Because uh, our, our good friend Orbino, who pulls out the stats um, for us for Opta, um, reminded us that Wolves, in the 12 games that they've gone ahead in this season, have not lost. They've won 11 and drawn. Uh, one of those. Mm-hmm. And then there's the bigger one, which is that under Mikel Arteta, amazingly, Arsenal have never turned around a halftime deficit to win a game, which is Wild. kind of mental, really. <laughs> it is one of those stats. I looked at it, though, and like I can't say that I was um, hugely confident. Like I was worried when we got the equalizer, I was like, you know what? Fucking fair play. We got the equalizer. I'll take a point out of this. You know, if you'd offered me a point five minutes beforehand, I would have grabbed, you know, bitten your hand off and the whole lot. But there was a little part of my brain that went, the law of averages suggests that at some point <laughs> we, we have to do this. We have to do this. And, uh, you know, I think... <sighs> To have overcome those two statistics, and I know those are things, you know, they're just facts and what have you. Those are things that we um, that we can um, put to one side to an extent. But it was still a situation whereby we really had to do something that we haven't done before in order to win this game. And holy shit, we did it. Uh, we'll come to the specifics of it. Mm. in a minute, but I want to talk about a couple of players um, who I think were instrumental to it. Let's leave aside Thomas Partey shooting for a moment, because (laughs) I'm not sure what the solution is there. Can I just uh, jump in really quick, because I wrote a tweet about this last night. One day, one of those is going to fly in the top corner, and it's going to be absolutely unbelievable. It's going to be a great day. It will be. (laughs) There were a load of people in my mentions saying, are you too young to remember John Jensen? I was just like, no, I'm not, actually. No, but a little different. But thanks. A little anyway, different. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, let's leave aside the shooting. But I thought he was very good yesterday. Yeah. Martin Odegaard, whose presence and, and 
seniority in this team is really quite interesting because he's only 23, but he feels like a senior player, even though he's barely yeah. a couple of years older than Saka and Smith Rowe and Martinelli, you know. Um, he was very good. And I think the much maligned or oft maligned Granit Xhaka as well in this slightly more advanced midfield role, which I think is interesting. Um, I wonder in part if it's to keep him out of trouble in a way, you know, where he gets into trouble is making challenges deep in our half or midway into yeah. our, that's, that tends to be where he gets into the most trouble and we're keeping him away from there, but we're, we're also asking him to, to use the ball and, and, and help us progress it into the final third. And I think he did that especially well in the final 20 minutes or so when we were really starting to, to put the pressure on. That midfield trio, and I know they're not necessarily a an archetypal or classic midfield three or whatever, but those three feel to me like a hugely important component in what the rest of this team can do. Yeah, I mean, midfields are important. Yeah. They, they affect everything around them. And it's arguably the most important area on the pitch if you're going to focus on one to get right. Because the accumulative impact that good midfield combinations have, still hugely underrated, I think, even in the modern game. I think we've seen before that I think Granit Xhaka is never quite as bad as people try to make out. However, there are obvious flaws there and that are often quite highlighted. And what I think Arteta has done really smartly is try to tailor the system to accentuate his strengths and just eliminate the possibility of him getting dragged in where his weakness has become mm. apparent. So like Granit Xhaka running towards his own box, trying to make a last dish tackle is like, as an Arsenal fan, one of the things that I would rather never ever see again in my life, <laughs> ever. Yeah. You know, um, however, him dropping into that kind of left back pocket to gather the ball and progress play is a real strength of his and something I think goes a little bit underappreciated. And he did that a couple of times last night in the Wolves game. So I think what happens is like Partey and Erdogan are very mobile. And I think Erdogan's defensive work, let's say, I'm not saying he's a, you know, going to be charging in and slide tackling and stuff like that. But I think he can track. He's got a really, you know, he covered the m more ground than yeah. what, any other Arsenal player this season. Yeah, apparently in, over, in over 12K in, in one yeah. game. So, And um, I think that impact can't be underestimated. I think Partey as well is just, is one of those players that he needs a couple of people who are going to be quite vocal around him. Like I watched him a lot at Atleti you know, the whole time he has like someone like Koke there, who's the captain, mm. you know, who's really kind of taking the leadership aspect away and really letting Partey just play. And I think that this midfield configuration and the slight tweak of pushing Xhaka a little bit higher has allowed Partey to have a little bit more space to 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 dominate in a football sense without taking out, without giving him extra quote unquote leadership responsibilities. Yeah that makes sense so it's just a really nice balance it just feels like a really nice balance i still think that in terms of an upgrade for the summer um another more mobile kind of version of Xhaka would be perfect for that midfield if you're going to go to the next level this is why in, in january i was i was saying quite a few times that because of barcelona's financial situation and the rumors coming out about chelsea dangling 50 million at them for frankie de Jong, i was just like if i was not going to make a signing actually i would i would go for that when Arsenal were in for Vlajevic, as yeah. great as Vlajevic is, but I, I personally thought chucking 50 million at Barca and then maybe the other 20 million for Artur Cabral would have been the better move for the whole squad. Yeah, And Frankie Dong has started playing some of his best football this season since January, which is a shame because I think he was probably gettable for a little bit. Yeah. But he's the kind of player who would be perfect in there and, instead of Xhaka. But having Xhaka to be able to come in for games but not having him as the number one for every game. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I think I just saw a story this morning when Xavi uh, Xavi was uh, calling De Jong a a genius. So I don't think he's (laughs) going to be going anywhere anytime soon. Yeah, not now. I think there was definitely a period and a window because Barcelona had, not wanting to go off topic, but Barcelona had so few flippable assets Mm. and he was one of them that if a club had really moved for him, I think it could have been gettable. And he's been on record saying that he wanted to go to Arsenal before Barcelona do the uh, do that route but yeah. you know oh well oh well no look I, I think you're right though you know that 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 um upgrade on jacket in that particular position because i think one of the one of the things that um you know, if you look at Odegaard on the right-hand side and Shaq on the left-hand side, ostensibly as those kind of eights, if you like, yeah. the difference in the quickness of feet is certainly something, you know? But yeah. I think Shaq did really well in that yeah, role. I, I think he had some moments where he really kept the ball and a couple of little sharp turns, a little nutmeg here and there as well, you know, and he really kept us going forward. So we should move on to talk about how we how we turned this um, because it was the 82nd minute when we um, when we scored the equaliser. Um, Gabriel Martinelli came off, Nicolas Pepe came on, but Kai Osaka shifted out to the left-hand side. And then I think probably the more interesting substitution is Eddie and Kedia coming on for Cedric Suarez. Yeah. Which was a touch, you know, a touch of the Arsene Wenger's in it, in that you take off a fullback, you put on a forward. We know we're not blessed with a great deal of depth uh, at striker. We don't have too many forward options. Smith Rowe wasn't in the squad last night. So the manager didn't have a great deal to deal with uh, or to work with off the bench. I think Omari Hutchinson was on the bench, but, you know, he's a young kid. Yeah. Maybe you throw him on with five minutes to go. If you still haven't got anything, last gasp, throw the dice and all that kind of stuff. But I was happy to see um, that change. Um, I don't mean it to be a reflection on Cedric, who I think played well. Um, It was more about what it stated, the intent that the manager had to try and change the game. We're taking a defender off. We're putting a forward on. We're just going to get more men in your final third and see what happens. I know it's a little more, um, not quite as industrial as that, but, but certainly it was an attacking change, a positive change, and it played a big part in uh, the first goal, which we saw from Nicolas Pepe. Lovely ball from Odegaard over the top. Eddie did really well to pull it back. And the more I watch the touch, turn, and finish from Nicolas Pepe, the more I'm impressed by it. It is absolutely sensational. For a guy you know, that hasn't played a lot this season for us. For a guy who's been on the sidelines and must be hugely frustrated not to be more involved, to have that composure and to have that um, ability to work that situation with so many Wolves players around him, it's quite funny when you look at the replay, they're looking in the goal, how the fuck did that go in? Because it it all happens in such a swift... um, what's the word I'm looking for? It was just like one moment. Yeah, very great. It's it's, it's one fluid moment. Fluid, that's exactly the word I was looking for. It was fluid. Touch, turn, shoot, bang, in goal. And it was fucking great. Yeah, I mean, he, this is kind of like the perfect role for Nicola Pepe at Arsenal, if you think about it. 20 minutes to go, add a chaos agent in there. And he, you know, for all the talk about Nicola Pepe, he, offers something that no one else in the Arsenal squad can do. And that's a really handy tool to have. And if he'd cost 30 million euros or 30 million pounds, mm. people would be like, this guy's perfect for this kind of role. I think the price clouds judgment a little bit over him. But he's kind of, I was thinking about this actually last night. I was like, who else in the Premier League could bring on a 70 odd million pound player who does that? And I was thinking... Man City, maybe? Man City, yeah. Like even Chelsea don't really have, or Liverpool. Liverpool have players that can hurt you, but they're all very much like plug and play at Liverpool. There isn't really anyone else like that in the top six, maybe, who have that kind of chaos agent to bring off the bench who cost around that much money. I know I'm being hugely, I'm generalizing a lot there, but yeah. but to me, I think if, if Arsenal can really fill out the squad, then having that role for Pepe where he can play against teams who are going to sit deep, who aren't just going to let you thread passes through them. You need that in a little bit of individualism sometimes. And I think yeah. he's so good at that. Um, it reminded me a little bit of a goal that you'd kind of see 
the Arsenal social admin put up from training. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, it's just yeah, like yeah. a kind of thing they do in training and be like, wow, Pepe in training, look at this, look at this kind of thing. Mm. But I'm, <clears throat> I mean, the last time we were on after the Man United game, we were talking about subs a lot and how we thought Arteta got the subs quite wrong in that game at Old Trafford. Yeah. This time, both subs were perfect. And he deserves so much credit for that because also I think Inketia, not wanting to move on from Pepe too quickly, but I think Inketia, he he genuinely changed the game. It was, I think it was one of the best performances I've seen, even though it was obviously not a huge amount of time. But in terms of, there have been games where Eddie Nketiah has come on and it's just felt very flat. Yes, I agree. You know? I agree. And I think what happened here was that he really injected some energy and some purpose and some, I don't know, a little bit more directness into Arsenal in that last 20 more, minutes. More presence. Yeah, more definitely. presence in their final yeah. third because, you know, we know how good they are defensively and, and they know how good they are defensively yeah. as well. But when you add, as you say, the chaos, um, the controlled chaos, I think might be a better way of, of yeah, putting it, sure. of, of, of Pepe, but also then the presence of Inquedia, uh, who is willing to run and get in behind and, and stretch a bit. And that goal doesn't happen without Inquedia's run the quality of the pass from Odegaard is brilliant, but he do, he does really well to make the run and to play the ball back to Pepe, who then from uh, the time he gets it does something superb. It's just it's just fantastic, so um, and I think you're right. Yeah, I mean the subs did change the game again. I don't know that he had a great deal of choice, but he could easily yeah. he could I think, uh, and we'll come to Lacazette now because we haven't even mentioned him yet, and I think he he needs a mention because. There might have been a game or this might have been a time in the past when Arteta would have put on Enkedia for Lacazette. Yeah, because I, I, I think Lacazette had a difficult game. He works very hard and I can't take any of that away from him, but it just wasn't quite there for him last night. The first touch wasn't brilliant. The layoffs weren't quite happening. The, um, the shooting... I mean, he was shooting. I think he ended up with seven or eight shots, something like that. But none yeah. of them were particularly threatening. There was one in the second half where he drew a good save from the goalkeeper. Like, he was trying his hardest, but it wasn't really working. And I think if we had had another senior forward option on the bench, I'm pretty sure he would have come off. Yeah, I agree. Um, so I have to say that I'm, you know even though the goal went down as an own goal, I think Lacazette can take a great deal of heart from his part in it, if you like. The fact that he was there, he made the combination, the little flick around the corner to Pepe was so good. The pass back from Pepe was perfect because there were a couple of, a couple of occasions in this game where I think it was um, Xhaka for Martinelli and Partey for Saka, where they had the chance to play that kind of pass and they overhit it. So the pass from Pepe was very good. And when you're a striker who hasn't scored in a while, it, it clearly has an impact on your confidence. You know that despite what, um, however people want to talk up the other aspects of your game, goal scoring is what people judge strikers on. How what they produce, how they produce it in time, that becomes an issue. But what they produce, how frequently and everything else. Like I said, hadn't scored since December 26th. He was well overdue a goal. Um, yeah. I, I think it's, you know, I think it's normal and right to demand goal scoring from your centre forwards, even if you can talk about how the role of a centre forward has changed a little bit in in certain teams where that player in that position can often be seen as like a facilitator for the guys either side who are the more prolific goal scorers. But I don't think we're there yet, so we need those goals. And I think Lacazette, as a, uh, as a forward who's spent his whole life scoring goals, will have been hyper aware of the fact that he hadn't. And sometimes you just need one like that. I mean, it's not officially his goal, but I think it's his goal, you know, for the yeah. endeavor, for the effort that he put in. Um, I think it's his goal. Um, and I hope that it can prove to be, it can take some of the weight off him a little bit because it did feel like he was playing with the burden of two months of not scoring. Yeah, it reminds me of when you start a career mode on FIFA and you're just trying to build the stats up and it's just everything goes through you. You know, when you're like doing your one-on-one -on -one <laughs> player guy, you're just like, 
and your energy is zero after 25 minutes because you've just been covering all the ground yeah, and trying yeah. all the shots. There was one in the second half where he had his back to goal about 12 yards out, I think. And he could have just laid it off to Erdogan. Oh, yeah, yeah. Of space. yeah. And he tried to, you know, Turn 180 and, yeah. and <laughs> ping it at the top corner. And I was just like, this is, for all of contract lacquer's strengths, this is the downside of contract lacquer. You know, mm. the contract lacquer playing for, you know, it's, it is like, you know, when people have contract years, when they know that all of a sudden they have to, they're almost in the shop window. And it's like, yeah, I get it. But he, you can't, like you said, you can't fault, fault his, his work rate, his effort, his energy, and his genuine, I think, passion. Yeah. I, I was, I was, I have to admit, I was a little bit concerned about, about Laka when Aubameyang left. I was a little bit worried how he would handle that because they were obviously very, yeah, very sure. close. And without knowing what had gone on internally, I was a little bit worried about whether he might kind of down tools a little bit and be mm. like, well, you kind of, you treated him like this. I'm not really that bothered anymore. But taking the armband and his work rate and like I say, effort and stuff like that since then has been amazing. It's, it's so weird that he's not scored for two months. Although there is part of me that thinks like, have we only ever, have we only played like four games since December? Like yeah. the fixture list has been so, so It has so been sparsely. a bit. I mean, that, that's fair to say that it has been a bit scant in terms of fixtures. So yeah, but, but still it's, I think for him internally in the squad mm. within the club, that will go down as his goal. It doesn't really matter whether it's down his, yeah. it's his goal statistically. And you could see from his reaction and from the uh, reaction of his teammates, yeah. you know, he was uh, flooded on the sidelines by not just the players on the pitch, but by the subs. Um, you know, that they were absolutely delighted for him as well. You know, and, and the the commitment, the passion, you know, this is a guy, realistically, I know there's talk of a contract and everything else, but realistically, this is a guy who's probably going to go in yeah. the summer and you can switch off or it can be a dangerous time for a player or or you go into self-protection mode where you don't want to run that extra bit you don't want to tweak a hamstring you don't want to risk an injury but there's none of that with him and you know we can we can acknowledge that our central uh, striking options are imperfect but i was i was genuinely delighted for him above and beyond yeah, the fact that we scored a 96 minute winner uh, in important uh, circumstances in a huge game against rivals who, you know, let's face it, if they'd won last night, they'd be ahead of us in the table right yeah. now. And now we're five points ahead of them. That is how big that swing is. So it was huge. It was huge. And it was, it was great to see. And I'm, I, I really do hope that it does lift some of that burden off him because yeah. we we need we need some goals from him and we need maybe a couple of goals from Eddie as well because Smith Rowe, Saka, Odegar, Martinelli, you know, as we saw last night, sometimes they're not going to be able to produce those moments that we need, and it's it's normal to expect your centre forward to to score some goals along the way too. So if it lifts the shackles off him a little bit, then it's it's going to be a hugely positive goal. Yeah, it's just, I mean, we talked to Wrighty about this quite a lot on Wrighty's house. And, you know, it's, you can't really ask for many better people to whose brains to pick with stuff like that. But he, he said it's like, you know, the actual, it's the game by game thing. We were talking about it with Aubameyang the other day because Aubameyang got a hat trick for, for Barca. One mm -hmm. of them just came off his back. Yeah. And, uh, and it's similar to what you were saying before about how strikers, even with the changing role of a number nine, they still have this very tangible metric that they they're judged on. Yeah, you know, it's not like a, you know, it's not like a right back can be like, oh, he's really thriving. You know, look at his kind of dribble pass stats and stuff like that. It's just like no goals. That is the thing, mm. rightly or wrongly, what they're what they're judged on. You know, I think that with Laka, never once since he's joined Arsenal has he ever looked like he hasn't given a hundred percent, and even when he's been a little bit grumpy, and I think he is a bit grumpy sometimes, but I kind of quite like that. At the moment with this young core, it's interesting what you said about, you know, uh, Smith Rowe, Saka, Martinelli, Erdogan, super young core around him. And he's kind of like that old grump. And he, he just has that little, that, that vibe sometimes where he's just like, fuck this, or like, fuck that. Especially mm. since he started shaving his head properly. Sh shaved head <laughs> lacquer is gnarly, you know? And I think that 
it's just really, I think for him, it's going to be really interesting to see what the next few games are like for him now that that's happened because I do think that was playing on his mind. Yeah. And you could see it a few times where he was trying just a little bit too hard to get rid of that. Um, maybe passing up better opportunities to lay it off. But yeah, I mean, he's... There's part of me that if... if well, I mean, there's, there's not just part of me. There's quite a, quite a large part of me, I think, that would would like to see if the terms were decent for him to stay, even if he's not going to be first choice. Because I think he is such a... He is such an inter- interesting component within that squad I think a lot of what's going on at Arsenal at the moment I'm wanting to go too far outside it but a lot of it is like squad makeup and a lot of those intangibles that togetherness that that kind of solidarity that vibe that seems to be around the squad at the moment he seems to be a major part of that and that's something that I don't worry about a little bit but it would concern me slightly you know if you remove him from that you're going to have to make sure that whoever comes in to replace them is that mm. number nine because remember Ket is probably going to go as well right so yeah So you're going to have to add, even if Lacazette stays, you should probably be looking, depending on what happens with Balogun on loan, you're probably going to be looking at getting at least two strikers in, in the Mm. summer. So I personally would love to see him stay, but I think the terms have just got to be right because what Arsenal have done a really good job on over the last couple of years is is addressing that wage bill and clearing off the hugely overpaid underperforming players and you know if Laka wants like 250 grand a week or something you just can't do that I don't think anymore. no you gotta, learn, you inter- gotta learn those think, lessons yeah a lot of that will be I think will yeah. also be based on what other office he has from elsewhere can we talk about how on top of the sheer euphoria of of scoring a late winner in a game like this in the sixth minute of injury time can we talk about Wolves' contribution to the fact that there were six minutes of injury time? I think there's a bigger discussion to be had about time wasting in football. And, you know, I'm not here to criticize it by any means because Arsenal have done it. We did it in our last game against Wolves. I think Gabriel got a, a yellow card for it. <laughs> they were doing it from the first half. Uh, the commentator on the stream that I was watching on went, well, they're doing it. Well, Arsenal did it in the first game. I was, I was thinking, well, you know, we were kind of down to 10 men and hanging on for our lives here. It's slightly different than doing it when you're 1-0 up after 20 minutes. Um, there were moments where I think Wolves... <sighs> manufactured occasions where lots of time was taken up. The Semedo injury, which was a couple of minutes at least. I think they could have got the player off the pitch a bit quicker, but they didn't. And the whole jimenez Pudence substitution thing when Jimenez got booked and it was like, well, no, I'll go off, I'll go off over there. Clearly um, predetermined when the manager talks to his team about how he's going to make changes. Like if we're going to make a change and the game state is this, go off the far side and, you know, take as much time as possible. Um, And it backfired because it provided us those extra minutes that we needed. So I'm very much an advocate that like, well, if you live by the sword, you might die by the sword from time (laughs) to time. And uh, I, I, I found that aspect of our win even more enjoyable because of all the stuff that's gone on about celebrations and how you should celebrate and when you should celebrate and if you should celebrate at all. You know, this part that they played in our win last night is kind of like the icing on the cake. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, with my pure Arsenal fandom is, you know... Yeah, leave your Arsenal hat home, on for this one. Sitting please. at home on my own, on the sofa watching it, a man deep into his 30s, giving the TV who can't even answer back the fucking both fingers being like, <laughs> fuck you, fuck you, have that, have that. But there's, but there was part of me afterwards that realised, when I read that thread from Johnny Singer, it was quite good about, he, he kind of clocked up all of the time that was wasted. And actually, I'm going to come with a little bit of an interesting take here. I think Wolves were actually hard done by because 
they wasted so much time that there probably should have been another four minutes on top of it. And if Arsenal had scored when they had, then, uh, then Wolves would have actually had an extra four minutes to try and get an equal. And, and actually, yeah, when you think about the, the <laughs> chance that they had after exactly. we equalised, exactly. remember that? I mean, yeah. that's another thing that's sort of been lost in the in the joy of this particular win is that when we equalised, they had a really <laughs> good chance and, and uh, the ball squirted just... I think Gabriel got a touch on it and it went for a mm. goal kick. The referee didn't see it. But boy, oh boy, that was close. And you're right. Yeah, maybe they would have had an extra few minutes. Few, yeah. But I think this was the whole thing about Martin Atkinson last night. And I think that I don't like going after referees too much because I think some of it, get, people people take valid criticism of referees and it turns very nasty very quickly. Mm. But I think the thing that really frustrates me is that they don't use the tools that are in place. The tools are there. Yeah, use stopwatch. Them. Fuck's yeah, sake. Stopwatch. This use the stopwatch. Simple. Like no one is going to complain. If you can, if you can turn around after the game and say, listen, here is why there were 11 minutes of, of stoppage time at the end of the game or nine minutes of stoppage time at the end of the game. No one's going to actually, weirdly, a lot of people would be like, wow, fair play. They're actually adding up the, the they're clock. doing it at last. But they're doing with, it, yeah. But with the not consulting VAR, and I don't know whether VAR just didn't bother looking at it or if they did, they just said to him, usually it comes up if they're checking, right? Mm. Whether they give it or not. It didn't seem like there was a check in place. I genuinely think if that happens after 12 minutes, it's a penalty. And also, Samedo's in trouble because he's he's stopped a goal-scoring opportunity. I know it's in the box and it's different now and all the mm. rules have kind of changed about that. And he does make a genuine attempt, I think, but still, he stops a goal-scoring opportunity. But also, there were just really basic things that Atkinson missed, like stuff that was so easily visible from watching it on TV. Like, he didn't give a corner to Arsenal in the first half that was a really easy to see. Yeah. He didn't give Wolves a, a corner that was really, really easy to see. I think it was Raul Neto was like... Uh, complaining about it so there was just these real basic things that seemed to not be taken care of and i think that that led to the overall lack of authority on the game i think it really felt like he didn't have a lot of authority like even when you know the cody benjamin white thing oh yeah 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 yeah. right Where, which i think is a dive right but to i do like, too yeah. yeah 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 but also cody they, 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 I don't know if it happened on the feed that you were on, but yeah, he was, on, went, Sky, he was on Sky in Germany. Yeah, it focused on him. And he, he screams at Atkinson for like 20 yards as he's charging towards him, pointing, all of this kind of stuff. And you can yeah. kind of make out what he's saying. And I was like, if that's Granit Xhaka, <laughs> you know, yeah, 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 it's yeah. a booking. Like, yeah. oh, to be honest, if it's Gabriel, it's a booking. If, yeah. if, and, I, and I don't like doing this whole conspiracy theory kind of like, if it was us kind of thing, because fuck it, whatever. There are 20 teams in the Premier League. But I do think sometimes that, you know, you've got a kind of a, uh, an English centre-back who, you know, interviews quite well post-game on Sky and has a bit of banter with the lads and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, and, they, and you could see Cody all game. Whenever there was a stoppage, he was right next to Atkinson the whole time, just talking to him, talking mm. to him, talking to him. And I really wish Arsenal did that a little bit more. I, I agree. I agree. Um, I'm not sure it's necessarily in our nature, but maybe when we get some more players in the England squad with a bit more seniority, we might we might feel inclined to do that. Ben White might well be one of those players. Yeah. I, I thought that was <laughs> absolutely a dive. Uh, but yeah, fair play to totally him. There was dive. another moment where, like, I, it was bad play from Ben White. It was yeah. There's a clip doing the rounds where he passes the ball. It could be straight to Ruben Neves. I'm not quite sure who it is. Um and Neves looks to play a pass to Jimenez, but Ben White, as he's running back, just kicks his heels very deliberately, cynically, yeah, kicks his heels. I mean, it's terrible. It really, <laughs> he gives the ball away, then makes the most obvious foul you will ever see in your life. But um, when I said I loved it on Twitter this morning, I didn't necessarily mean the cynicism of it, although... I'm very much a fan of of that kind of cynicism from central defenders. Um, I I I love it really when we do it. But what I loved was we got away with it. We got away mm. with something, and like in a in a season where it feels like so much stuff has not gone our way, where decisions aren't in our favor, where even the smallest thing is punished to the most um, to the maximum level. The fact that we got away with something just as small as that was hugely entertaining to me. Yeah, definitely. Sorry, one thing before we go on. I think I said Raul Neto. I meant Pedro Neto. That's fine. Nobody Silly boy. Minds. So, uh, I mean, if you want to chop that, you can chop that. I'll just say Neto. No, it's but, okay. Uh, my bad. 
I called. Um, we'll I we'll call really... up. We'll call up the Neto family afterwards and offer them our yeah. uh, uh, my uh, deepest apologies. Sorry, Pedro. Yeah, yeah. I, did, I did this the other day. I can't remember who it was, but I basically got a footballer and, a, and an actor confused because they have a similar sounding surname, and I used the actor's first name and the footballer's surname. <laughs> and I was just like, "What the hell?" Um, um, Sorry, Andrew, I lost my trailer for we're to- We were talking Ben White. Look, there's no need to, to go on. I'm just talking about that bit. One final thing that I think we have to talk about is the what, what a win like this means in broad terms yeah. in these circumstances, as we talked about um, coming from behind for the first time under Michael Arteta to win a game, um, you know, being behind at halftime, not just from behind, you know, dealing with Wolves, defensive parsimony and all that kind of stuff. And and what these kind of results mean for a group that is growing and developing and and coming together, you could see, obviously, in very basic terms, how much it meant to them afterwards because they've won a game and they've won it in those circumstances and everyone would celebrate. But I think when we're talking about the progression and development of a young team and we're looking for things, intangibles, if you like, you can't measure character or spirit or whatever you want to call it, non givey uppiness. You can't measure those things. Mm. But we can all see a team that doesn't have those qualities and doesn't have those characteristics. We can all we can spot them a mile away. We've yeah, had we've them had at Arsenal recently. Yeah. yeah. This group of players has something about them in that regard. And to me, that's another really encouraging part of what we did yesterday. It's not always going to work out for you, but I think moments like this and results like this allow you to feel as a group of players that you can do it again and you can do it again and that when games are looking like they're going away from you, it's not a foregone conclusion that you're going to drop all the points. You have the ability to turn it around and take three. It's all about just building, for want of a better term, but almost like muscle memory. Mm. You know, this is a side who beat Spurs, beat Manchester United, drew with Chelsea. Beat Leicester. Beat Leicester, ran Man City extremely close at the Etihad. And Arsenal have beaten them twice in the league. They've done the double over them this season. Also, the coming from behind thing at half time just adds that extra level of belief in scenarios like that mm. at later games. And I think it's all about just adding the blocks, you know, just keep adding little bits here and there that generate progress or contribute to the progress. But it's so hard to measure because it extends outside of the squad. Because I, I for example, I can't remember seeing a game at the Emirates where the crowd are like hyping everything after half an hour like it's the last five minutes of, of a game and Arsenal are chasing a winner. Mm. It started early because I think people are really invested in this team now, like I said earlier on. And I think that the whole thing together, the whole combination, and you continually adding little bits where, you know, okay, this is a good team. This is a team that historically Arsenal, who are set up in a way where historically Arsenal just don't do that well against. And We've all seen those kind of games where we've just been camped in their half for an hour and we've created nothing, but we've had all the ball or we've hit the post or we've done this. And I think getting through those or passing those tests, and this is again the thing that I'm saying, this is a team in progress and it's all about passing those tests or passing these little checkpoints that down the line, mm. they're going to have to draw on that experience from, you know? Yeah. going Because it might not be, it might sound a little bit over the top to say, but being 1-0 down against a side like Wolves at halftime and coming back and winning the game might really help Arsenal, say, for example, if they're 1-0 down against Manchester United at the Emirates this season, when the when they come to the Emirates later on in the season, that, that experience of doing it against Wolves might really help then. And this is another thing about last night, is that because of the games in hand, picking up the points in those games in hand, because Arsenal do have to play Chelsea and they do have to play... Spurs. And uh, sorry, they do have to play Spurs and they do have to play Manchester United. So they're playing teams around them. Mm. So it's just, it's, it, there isn't one singular important factor from this game that I think is the reason why it's so important. It's just, 
it contributes to so much that is really, really important in Arsenal progressing back to a point where they're consistently challenging for top four again. Yeah. You know? I know. Look, it's um, it's a big win. It feels like shades of the 2-1 win over Leicester in 2016. I know the stakes at that particular point of that season were much, much higher. But we have to we have to really take the take the positive from this one and make sure that we don't fall flat in our next game as we did after that Leicester game. The euphoria, I think, is something that as fans and players we can share, but the important part is to keep this going. And the the other thing I guess you would say about, you know, where we are and how we've got there is there is a measure of consistency to what we're doing and how we're doing it um, uh, at this moment in time, which I, is another aspect of when you think about our top four chances, um, it, it gives you a bit of confidence because there has been consistency. It's not quite as roller coastery as it has been in, in seasons past. So look, it's promising, it's encouraging, it's enjoyable. And thank you for taking the time to uh, to talk about this one with me. I'm glad it was better than the last time, obviously after the Manchester United game. And uh, I'm glad it was better than you thought it was going to be at halftime yesterday. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Next time. I hope it's the same. <laughs> Cheers, Ryan. Cheers, man. Thank you very much indeed to Ryan. You can find him on Twitter. He is at Ryan Hun, at Ryan Hun. And of course, he is the co-host of the Stadio podcast along with Musa Kwanga. And he appears on Wrighty's House as well with the one and only Ian Wright. Okay, in the interests of getting this podcast out for everybody to listen to, I'm going to leave it there for now. I just want to take a moment to say to all of our Arsenal supporting friends in Ukraine right now, I know there are many of you out there that I I'm thinking of you and I hope that you and yours can stay safe and well. I can't even begin to imagine what it's like, how scary and terrifying it must be. So for all that it's worth, sending you lots of love and lots of support uh, from here. Right. To all of you, thank you very much as always for being here. Thank you for listening and we will catch you on the next one. Until then, cheers. Bye-bye. Okay, rather than an end bit today, I did talk in the first bit of the show that we might just touch base with James, and we have done exactly that. James, goodly morning. It is. It is a goodly, goodly morning indeed. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. I'm good. I'm, I'm quite buzzing after last night. And uh, have you had a chance to to sift through the events of of those <laughs> 90 minutes? Yeah. Oh, no, sorry, those 96-odd minutes? I have to say, it's quite an enjoyable way to go about it. I think I'm going to avoid more Arsenal games in future <laughs> and then bask in the glow of victory after the fact is secured. Oh. I, it, I mean, it's interesting, actually. You know, I'm an Arsenal fan, season ticket holder, but I've missed some big Emirates Stadium moments in my time. I was on stage when Thierry Henry came back and scored in the FA Cup against Leeds. I remember coming off stage to a text message about that. Um, and I was uh, abroad when Danny Welbeck scored against Leicester at the Emirates Stadium. So I think they just keep me away from that ground. You know, I think maybe so. Maybe it, Maybe I'm a bad omen. Who yeah, knows, we'll but... do a little bit of a GoFundMe for you. <laughs> yeah, you need to keep me employed as an actor. That's the real <laughs> trick. If only I had any talent. But um, yeah, incredible result. And it was a weird one for me because my show starts at nine o'clock and yeah. the game was a 7.45 kickoff. So I had this conundrum of, like I was in my dressing room thinking like, do I put the game on, on my phone? Like, it's a high risk strategy, you know. If we if we're losing, uh, then I'll, I'll go on all feeling all distracted and distressed. So I, I told myself I wasn't going to watch it, but then 
I did the worst possible thing, which is that I didn't watch it. I just intermittently checked the score like oh, no. every three minutes. Yeah. So, you know, I saw, oh, penalty appeal denied. And then I saw we'd given a goal away and I logged on to Amazon and watched the goal and thought, oh, my God. And, you know, Wolves are such a difficult team to play against when they're ahead in front, as the stats show and as the time wasting demonstrates too. So I went on knowing we were losing. Let me ask you a question about this because, you know, yeah. I, I've never done, uh, and never will do, a one-man show on stage <laughs> in, in front of people. Yeah. But I, I guess if I was doing it, even if I was pretty comfortable with the material and I'd done it before and I knew what I was doing and I felt confident, et cetera, et cetera, I imagine that you kind of have to get yourself into a into a little bit of a zone, right? When you yeah. know the curtain is coming up, you know there are going to be these sea of faces looking at you. <laughs> Here we are now, entertain us kind of thing. You know, there, yeah. there, there has to be like a measure of concentration on all that kind of stuff. So I completely get what you're saying about not wanting to be distracted by something as, in inverted commas, trivial as football. But I mean, how do you... How do you possibly separate the two things from your life? Because Well, very difficult. Very difficult. And like I say, I failed. I mean, I told myself I wasn't even going to look at the score. I obviously completely failed to do that. And then, yeah, I, I suppose it got to half time, and then I had to kind of go into the theatre and the audience were about to come in. And that's when I managed to kind of focus up and think about the task at hand. Yeah. But there was an extraordinary event uh, during the show, so, <laughs> which I did tweet about, so you yeah. may have seen. But yeah, so, so the show, the show is like you know, it's a comedy show, but it's pretty theatrical. Like you know, it's there's a sort of a, 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 an element of kind of audience involvement, but it's pretty gentle. You know, once it's on its rails, I'm doing the show, and you know, usually it's kind of pretty similar night after night. And there are bits in the show where I show clips or like slides or videos mm. and when i when i do i sort of just go and sit at the side on this little stool and <laughs> at one point about halfway through the show last night i went and sat on the stool and something that's never happened i must have done this show 50 times maybe more i felt a hand on my back <laughs> and a guy had come out of the audience put his hand on my shoulder, leaned into my ear, in full view of the rest of the audience, by the way, <laughs> leaned into my shoulder and just went, do you want Arsenal Lacazette win a 95th minute? <laughs> and then just <laughs> backed away and returned to the audience. And I honestly, it was so funny. He came up to me after the show. He was like, I'm so sorry. I just, it came up on my watch and I just had to tell you. And uh, he said the previous video where you'd sat down, you'd had about 30 seconds to kind of, um, you know, mm. sit there before you got up again. And he said, the problem is I came up and told you the score. And then I realised the video ended two seconds later and suddenly you had to be doing the comedy show again. <laughs> and it, he was absolutely right. I had to be like, OK, thank you. And just immediately carry on with the show. But it was very reassuring. It meant I could finish, you know, with any lingering doubts or concerns I had in my mind yeah. evaporated so on the one hand um it was strange and unusual but on the other i appreciated it the theater staff came up to me after the show and they, they were all like were well, you all right we've never seen that before someone getting up on the stage to try and talk to someone during a show um we hope you're okay let us know if we want to like introduce any security measures <laughs> or like do an announcement before the show and i had to just be like no 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 um he was telling me the Arsenal score. <laughs> he knows I'm a massive Arsenal fan and he was just telling me the Arsenal score. Oh, that is that is genuinely hilarious, isn't it? It's just yeah. fucking brilliant. Like the idea that this guy... I mean, you kind of have to get out of yourself in a way to be part of the audience and then to get up and to go to the guy on the stage and tell you... I mean... <sighs> I would feel uh, you'd have to lose pretty much all your inhibitions to do that. And I'm pretty sure this guy is like a, uh, um, it must be a listener maybe to the show. So yeah. if you're listening, I'm not trying to be disparaging in any way, but probably just a normal guy who got like absolutely carried away in the euphoria of getting that notification on his watch in the middle exactly. of a comedy show. 
and and he said to me afterwards, he was like, you know, I'd been watching the first half in the pub. So yeah. he was already kind of emotionally invested in the game, as I guess we all were. Probably had a couple of drinks and, um, yeah, felt the need to tell me during the show on stage. And I honestly, I don't mind at all. It was, It didn't really seem to affect the show in any way. And it was great to hear. And it meant I could come off and, as I say, absolutely bask and revel in the celebrations. Yeah. And, you know... They they didn't want to see us celebrating again, and unfortunately, they really had to put up with it. And yeah, those scenes from the Emirates last night in the crowd and on the pitch just look brilliant. I mean, oh, what, unbelievable. A, what a big, what a big win! What that a is. big win you missed. I know, I know. <laughs> but I honestly, I if honestly, I'll miss them all between now and the end oh. of the season if they're going to be like that. I mean, that it's really, really good. Yeah. And, and January was tricky for lots of reasons but february we've had three really good results nine great points big steps yeah I, I, yeah i i feel great about it and I, honestly it's not a question of like oh and now we're gonna get top four definitely and we're on the home straight i'm convinced there's a roller coaster to come and ups and downs mm. i feel certain of that and that, you know what happened with Spurs beating Man City and then losing to Burnley it demonstrates that but it's impossible to not feel energised about yeah. you know the group and particularly the connection between the players and the fans which just feels stronger than it has for such a long time yeah I agree we could probably and will probably talk about this a little bit more on Monday um, yeah. when we do the Irish Cast Extra so I don't want to keep you too long and thank you um, thank you for dipping in uh, just to, t- to tell us that story which is a-, a fantastic story and there are so many things that people can enjoy online today brilliant clips doing the rounds the celebrations um, we've got to give a shout out to David Price um, one of the Arsenal photographers who took a an incredible picture of Aaron Ramsdale celebrating right in front of Ruben Neves, which is like, oh, uh, put that in a fucking gallery somewhere. Actually, just build a gallery specifically for that photograph. The Aaron Ramsdale gallery. Yeah, uh, unbelievable. So loads for people to um, uh, to sink their teeth into. Uh, we leave it there, James. Thanks a million. Enjoy the weekend and we'll catch you on Monday. Cheers. Bye-bye.